All right, if you will turn with me to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. The Atlantic online newspaper, online journal type thing, asked 10 prominent politicians, historians, professors. Oliver Stone was in there as well, director. I don't know what he's prominent for, but anyway, he was in there. They asked 10 men and women from various professions, pretty high up in their professions, what was the single most important event in history? What is the event that changed human history the most? And there was a diversity of answers, as you might expect. One guy thought the polio vaccine was one. As you got vaccinated, I know there's a lot of doctors and nurses in here. Maybe they could see something behind that. One who I thought was closer to the truth. One person said the printing press. Think about things that have changed human history. Obviously, the printing press, all these things that we have in front of us and that we use come from the printing press. One person talked about the assassination that began World War I which eventually led to World War II and led to really the shaping of the modern world. Okay, so there were a variety of answers, a variety of suggestions, a variety of things that people thought would be were the most world-changing events. But it was odd, even when you're talking about a secular audience, it was odd that Jesus did not come up a single time. Not one time, not even, not even referenced in, in a side here you have a man who, whether you believe he was God or not, changed the course of human history in dramatic fashion, in dramatic ways. The entire course of Western history has been shaped by the Christian word, by the scriptures, and by what Jesus did upon the cross and his resurrection from the dead. It is odd that if you ask the people, the prominent people in this world, that Jesus would never come up as a world-changing event, his life or his death, or his resurrection, or any of it, would never come up as a life-changing event. Well, the gospel writers felt differently. The gospel writers felt very differently about this. And it's interesting that Matthew, one-fourth of Matthew's gospel is devoted to the last eight days of Jesus' life. The last eight days. This morning we enter into the Sabbath day before the uh, crucifixion, which will be that following Friday. So we're looking at here in chapter 21, a transition. And all the gospel writers, when they come to this point in Jesus' life, they slow down. They slow way down. We've been moving through Jesus' life at a very quick pace. Parables here, Sermon on the Mount there, healings there, rebukes there. Okay, but now they slow way down. And Matthew spends the last seven, eight chapters of his gospel talking about this last week of Jesus Christ. This last week of Jesus Christ... These eight days are the center of human history. They are the hinge on which, all, on which all of human history turns. No event that can be compared to it. Everything led up to it and everything leads from it. It is the center of human history and the center of the world. This life, death, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ so what I want us to get here as we move into these next several chapters, I want us to understand that. I want to understand what we're looking at here. Okay, We're not looking at just somebody who died. We're not just looking at somebody who's kind of semi-important. We're looking at the absolute epicenter of what the world is about. Look at the very center of it. And Matthew does something here, and I want to bring this to your attention as well. Throughout Matthew, we've been focusing on kingdom. Kingdom's been kind of at the front. Sermon on the Mount, how we're supposed to live in the kingdom. The parables in Matthew 13, the parables of the kingdom. Jesus in Matthew 4 went out preaching the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Matthew 18, which we just went through a couple weeks ago. How are we supposed to live in the kingdom of heaven? If you want to live in the, be in the kingdom of heaven, you must be as a child. Okay? And so on and so forth. So the kingdom has been at the front. Well, now, And the king has been there, obviously, but the king has kind of been in the background. Well, now we get a shift where the kingdom goes to the background and the king comes to the front. The next few chapters are all about the king. Who is Jesus? What type of man is he? Is he the son of God? Is he the son of David? Is he just an imposter? Does he have authority in the temple or not? Can he curse? Can he bless? Who is Jesus Christ? Okay, and that is really the question that Matthew wants us to answer and wants to show us 
He wants to answer over the next eight chapters. Who is Jesus? So kingdom recedes. It's there, obviously. But kingdom recedes, and the king comes forward. Okay, so the next several sermon titles all have king in them. This one's called Enter the King. And if any of you are old Bruce Lee fans, Bruce Lee had that movie, Enter the Dragon. I don't know what, what the parallel is. But anyway, there it is. Enter the king. Next week is the king who cleanses and the king who curses. And the week after that, the king who crushes. Okay, so we're moving through and we're getting a picture of who Jesus is as king. All right, so that's kind of the introduction to basically the next eight chapters, not just to chapter 21. But I want us to understand what is happening here. This, this passage is typically referred to as the triumphal entry. Okay, Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And uh, he tells his disciples to go and find a colt, find a donkey, and bring it to him. And then he sits on this donkey and rides into Jerusalem. It's important to note the people who are with him are people who have traveled with him. These are Galileans who are coming into Jerusalem with Jesus Christ. Um, just a couple other notes for the path, from the passage. The Mount of Olives in verse 1, is only mentioned two other times in the Old Testament. Two times in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in Zechariah 14.4, where all you eschatology buffs here, in Zechariah 14.4, where Jesus will stand on the top of the Mount of Olives and it will split east to west. Okay, Zechariah 14.4. But it's also mentioned in 2 Samuel chapter 15. And this is, I think, more what we're looking at. 2 Samuel chapter 15 is David's exile from Jerusalem, being kicked out by his son, Absalom and David descends down the Mount of Olives to leave. He is the suffering king. And in a sense, I think Matthew's reminding us of that event and the donkey thing as well. Reminding us of that event with David that we are going to see a king who is going to suffer here. Okay, we're not going to see a ruler like the world. Okay? So Jesus tells his disciples, Go find me a colt, go find me this donkey. And if if you have if somebody says, What are you doing with this? Say the Lord needs it. Okay, the Lord needs it, verse 3. It appears that Jesus had this set up, had a friend in Jerusalem that he visited with and had this already prearranged and pre-set up so he could go and get that. And then Matthew brings to us this quote from Zechariah chapter 9. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. All throughout Matthew, he has given us this sort of fulfillment prophecy. He's done it in Matthew 1, Matthew 2, Matthew 8, Matthew 12, Matthew 13, Matthew 4. He's done it all throughout the gospel. And he wants us to understand something here. And this is the first point I want you to get this morning. Jesus is the promised king. Okay, this is the point of this passage. All right, This is the plain point of the passage. Jesus is the promised king. He is the one that has been promised from Genesis 3.15. He's the one that was promised with Abraham. He's the one that was promised with Moses. He was the one that David was a picture of. He's the one that's promised in Isaiah and Malachi and Zechariah and Micah and all those different prophets. He is the promised king. He is the one that everyone has been waiting on. Everyone has been longing for. Everyone has been looking for. That's who Jesus is. And if you think about Israel and how many men came and they thought, maybe this is the God. I mean, maybe it's David. Maybe it's Moses. Maybe it's Solomon. I mean, Solomon's kingdom was the greatest that Israel had ever seen. Maybe he's the one that is going to deliver us. But all throughout history, they waited and they kept waiting and they kept waiting. But finally, the Messiah comes. Finally, the Messiah shows up. And that is one of the key points of Matthew's gospel. He wants us to know that Jesus is the promised king. He is the one that was promised from the very beginning. And what, what should this do to us? I mean, what, why, would, why would Matthew make such a big point about this? And how should this impact us and impact the way we think and the way we live? Well, obviously, one of the main things is he wants us to worship. I mean, he wants us to worship Jesus. We sit here and we every Sunday we come in here and we come to this table and we hear the word preached and we sing songs. But it's so easy for us to drift from the fact that Jesus is worthy of our worship. It's so easy to forget to bend the knee to him. And Matthew's emphasis on Jesus as the king, on Jesus as the reigning king, means we're supposed to worship. We're supposed to fall down. Our lives are supposed to be ones that are devoted to Jesus Christ as our king. Think of Simeon and Luke. When the baby Jesus shows up, he rejoiced in Luke chapter 2 because here was the long-promised king. Think of Zacharias in his prophecy over John the Baptist. And again, in Luke chapter 1, Zacharias says... Here's the long-promised king, and he rejoiced. So for us, as we sit here and we hear this a lot, so it's easy for us to become dull to it. 
It's easy for us to forget who Jesus is. One thing Matthew wants us to do is he wants us to worship. He wants us to fall down. Think about Paul saying, Blessed be the Lord God of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every blessing in the spiritual places, in the heavenly places. Remember John, behold what manner of love we should be called the children of God. The New Testament writers look back to Jesus, and he was not just a doctrine. He was the king. He was the one to be bended to. He was the one to fall down before. He was the one to worship. And so as we come to this phrase from Zechariah, and as we go throughout these next couple of chapters, we want to remember that simple fact. Jesus is worthy of our worship. Jesus is worthy of us falling down and rejoicing in what he has done and rejoicing that he is king. There's a second thing Jesus' kingship does for us. When I was a kid, my mom liked, my mom liked to mow the grass. I know there's probably not a lot of grass-mowing women in our congregation here, but my mom loved to mow the grass. My dad would always tell her, now, don't mow the grass, sweetie. I'll, when I get home, I'll do it or, or whatever, have one of the boys do it. But when I was young, I was probably eight or nine, my mom's out mowing the grass, and a nail shoots up into her leg. And I mean, she just, she is bleeding everywhere. I mean, blood just all over the place. Okay? So we get these huge bath tiles, and she's wrapping around her leg, and we call my dad. And my dad is coming, but he, lives, he works about 20, 25 minutes away. Okay, so we got this towel around her leg, and she's just bleeding everywhere, bleeding everywhere. Of course, as an eight-year-old, I'm just scared to death. I'm just scared to death. What's, what's going to happen? Is something going to happen to my mom? Well, finally, my dad shows up. And what happens at that moment to me when my dad shows up? There's a sigh of relief. <sighs> Dad's here. Everything's going to be okay. And that's part of the kingship here. The whole world breathes a sigh of relief when Jesus shows up. The whole world is bleeding out. The whole thing's falling apart. The whole thing's come unfrayed. Where is the one who's going to stop the bleeding? Where is the one who we can breathe a sigh of relief and go, ah, he's finally here. Ah, he finally showed up. Okay? And that's part of what Matthew wants us to get by telling us that Jesus is king. He has come so that we might be confident so that we might have courage, so that we might know that all is well. That all is well and all will be well. Because Jesus, the King, has come. There's no need to fear. There's no need to worry. There's no need to be anxious because the King has come. Paul Tripp, again, I'm, I'm quoting from Paul Tripp here. He's a counselor at Westminster Theological Seminary. And he says, we are our own most important counselors. Okay? We are our own most important counselors. And the reason for that is we are the ones that talk to ourselves the most. Okay? You might talk to a counselor for an hour. You might talk to your pastor for an hour. You might talk to a friend for a couple hours. But we all talk to ourselves all the time, every day. We tell ourselves certain things over and over and over again. Okay? Part of what we need to do is keep telling ourselves that Jesus is king, all will be well. Keep telling ourselves that. When the train has come off the tracks... We need to say to ourselves, all will be well. Jesus is king. When fear, anxiety, worry tend to rule in our hearts, we need to say to ourselves, all will be well. Jesus is king. So Matthew wants us to get this point. He's hammered it all throughout his gospel. But this is really the culmination of that particular point, that because Jesus is king, all is going to be well. And so we can have confidence. We can have courage. We don't have to be afraid. We can have peace because Jesus, the king, has come. Okay, so Jesus is the promised king. Right? He's the one that brings us to our knees in worship, and he's also the one that brings peace and courage and confidence to our hearts. All right? But there's something else I want to bring to your attention here, particularly about this prophecy. Verse 4 and verse 5. You and I cannot even predict what will happen in the next four hours. I mean, you think you know what's going to happen. You think you know where you're going to be. You hope you're going to be full and have eaten food in the next by the time four hours is up. But most of us cannot even predict what's going to happen in the next four hours. We cannot even, we can say, well, I think it's going to go this way, or I think it's going to go that way. I'm going to be eating at this friend's house, or eating at Dr. Moss's house, or whatever the case may be. But you get a flat tire. You get stalled in traffic. Something else can come up. Zechariah's prophecy was 400 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Zechariah's prophecy was 400 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 31, 15, which is quoted in Matthew 2, was 600 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Isaiah, which is quoted as being fulfilled in Matthew 8, was 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. 
And in Matthew 27, in a few chapters, we'll get a quote from Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 is written a thousand years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Part of what Matthew is doing here is he's showing us the faithfulness of the Word of God. The faithfulness of the Word of God. The surety of the Word of God. We lose this. We think all this fulfilled prophecy is a way to prove that the Bible is the Word of God. Instead of for it to strengthen our own hearts, to strengthen our own lives. God's Word is the most sure thing that you and I have in this life. There's nothing comparable. The words of our friends, the words of our family, they might be good, they might be fine, but they can break them. They can lie, they can say things like that, they can disobey. God's Word is sure. God's Word is strong. And what Matthew has done by telling us over and over and over again that God's word has been fulfilled, is he's reminding us of this fact. We lose our awe at God's word sometimes. We lose our awe that 400 years after it was written, it was fulfilled. And you and I can't even predict four hours from now. And God so moved history, so wove history together, that 400 years after Zechariah said this, it was perfectly fulfilled. Perfectly fulfilled. Think about the soldiers at the bottom of the cross. Casting, gar casting lots for Jesus' garments. That was predicted in Psalm 22, a thousand years before Jesus was crucified. So part of what Matthew wants us to see in this particular section, and by using that phrase, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is used throughout his book, is Matthew wants us to see the surety of God's word. He wants us to understand how true and faithful God's word is. But this is not just so we have facts in our head. This isn't just like a Jeopardy. Oh, Jeopardy question. Zechariah was written 400 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. What, is, uh, what was written 40 years? 40 years before the birth of Christ. What is Zechariah? You know, something like that. I'm trying to get the phraseology right. It's not just a Jeopardy question. Okay. The point with all of this is for our lives to be shaped and our lives to be changed. Okay. The point is always ethical. The point is always moral. And what does this teach us? Well, first of all, it teaches us that when we look back, we should stand in wonder and awe at the way God has woven together human history. Okay? We should stand in wonder and awe at the way God has woven together human history. We, we, did we kind of just, oh, yeah, 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 prophecy has been fulfilled, sure. But we should, again, this should lead us to worship the living God who reigns over human history, who rules over human history. But it's really much more than that. It gives us the confidence as we move forward that God is going to fulfill his promises. And this is really the most important thing. As we look at Matthew 21 and we say God perfectly fulfilled these promises in Jesus' life 400 years after the time it was prophesied, we can look forward and say we know that God is going to fulfill the promises that he's made to us. That's why this is here. It's not just here for facts, it's here so that our hearts might take courage. So that we're stuck and we do not believe that God's word is going to be true. We don't see it with our eyes, we don't feel it in our heart. We can't see it with our minds. It looks like God's word is crumbling. We can come back to this and say, no, God always keeps his promises. God always fulfills his word. So it's not just wonder looking back, but it's also hope looking forward. It also gives us hope and courage as we move forward. God's word has some amazing promises. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He who began a good work in you will carry it through to completion. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Ephesians 3.20, he is able to do abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. And we can go on and on and on like this. And a lot of times we come to these promises and our hearts fail. We say to ourselves, how can that be? Everything seems in disarray in my life. It doesn't look like God is fulfilling those promises. But when we come back to that, when we feel that way, we need to come back to his already fulfilled promises and say that he has already done this and he's already fulfilled his promises. And therefore, we can be sure that he is going to do this in the future. And this is, again, something we need to keep telling ourselves over and over and over again. A lot of us view these facts like God's going to keep his promises almost like an addition fact. 2 plus 2 is 4. Okay, I got it. Now I'm done with it. Let me move on. Okay? So we view it as a fact to be downloaded. All right? I just, okay, I got it. God keeps his promises. All right, I heard that March 3rd, 2013. That's great. Got it. Mark it down. I'm ready to move on. 
But that's not how the word works. The word is like an exercise. We're supposed to exercise ourselves in the word. So let's use a different illustration. Let's imagine a guy who wants to learn how to bench press. And he goes into the weight room and he spends 30 minutes bench pressing. All right, I got that down. I'm done. I'm done. I'm moving on. You know? Well, he's not going to become stronger by just doing it a couple of times. He has to keep repeating the process day in and day out over and over and over again. So for us, we need to keep reminding ourselves that God's word is faithful. We need to keep reminding ourselves that when we read it in the morning, when we talk to our children about it, when we hear it preached, we need to remember that God's word is faithful. And we need to keep telling ourselves that over and over and over again. So we become strong, strong on this point. We become like those guys who have lifted weights. And they can go in there and they can bench 250 and not think about it. Why? Because they've done it over and over and over again. So Matthew is telling us here in this passage, God's word is sure. It is going to be fulfilled. And really, Matthew's been telling us this his whole book. Okay. So we want to remember that this is the promised king and that God's word is faithful. God's word is faithful. And he is going to do what he has promised. Okay, so we've got the promised king. We've got God's word. It's faithful. And now we've got what type of king is this? Okay, what type of king is Jesus? And this we find in verse 5. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Let me read you from Zechariah. I don't know if you guys noticed the shift here. But Matthew leaves a phrase out of Zechariah. And you wonder well, why. I'm going to tell you in a minute. But here's what Matthew said, or here's what Zechariah says. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So he leaves out that phrase, he is just and having salvation. And the reason Matthew leaves that out is because he wants us to focus on that word, in my translation, lowly. He wants us to focus on that word lowly. What type of king is this? What type of king is this? Is this a king that's going to come in and destroy is this a king that's going to come in and crush and ruin and hurt? Is this a king that's going to come in with his marauding army and ravage and pillage the city? What kind of king is this? And the word is he's a humble king. That is his character trait. That is who he is. And we have seen this over and over again throughout Matthew. So see here Matthew 21. Matthew's bringing together a lot of these themes that we have already seen. He is a humble king. King. Jesus emphasizes this beginning back in Matthew 5, the poor in spirit, moving all the way through the gospel. Jesus has emphasized that belong, to belong to his kingdom, we must be a humble people because he is a humble king. Okay. Now part of the difficulty with this is we don't want to be humble. We don't like humility. I mean, if you had a choice between being James Bond and Napoleon Dynamite, who would you pick? I don't know if everybody knows who Napoleon Dynamite is, but who would you pick? James Bond or Napoleon Dynamite? Well, I think most of us would say, well, we want to be Bond. Or at least we want our hero to be Bond. Okay? Maybe we know we're Napoleon Dynamite, but we don't want our king to be like that. We want our king to be proud and haughty in a sense. That's what we like in this world. That's what the people of this world like, and that's what we in our flesh want. But Matthew's telling us here by citing Zechariah chapter 9, that Jesus is not that way. Jesus is lowly. He is humble. And it should not surprise the Israelites that this is the case. If you think about the history of Israel, think about King David. We think of David as his mighty warrior, and he was. But he also endured a lot of suffering. A lot of suffering. Whether you're talking about Saul, or whether you're talking about Absalom, he endured a lot of suffering. And then if we get to some of the key prophecies, Isaiah 53... What's the picture in Isaiah 53? This great and mighty king marching into the city, smashing down everybody? No. The picture is one of humility. The picture is one of brokenness. The picture, let's just read a couple of verses from there. He shall grow up before them as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. And the whole chapter of Matthew 53, or Isaiah 53 bears that out. Israel should not have been surprised that this was the type of king that was coming. Whether you're talking about Isaiah, whether you're talking about David, or whether you're talking about um, Zechariah chapter 9. Jesus was to come as a humble king. Jesus was to come as someone who was lowly. 
Okay? And what does this mean? And what does this mean for Jesus? We think of humility often in the context of sin. Jesus didn't sin. So he's not talking about sin. Okay? We think about our own selves and we say we're humble because we are sinners and we're all sinners. But Jesus wasn't a sinner. So what does it mean that Jesus was humble? I think the answer is found back in chapter 20, in verse 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. What is humility? Humility is service. The humble man is the one who serves those around him. The humble woman is the one who serves the lady who serves those around her. Jesus is saying, I have come not to be served, but to serve. And that's what humility is. And therefore, if we are going to be part of this kingdom, if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, our goal and our aim should be to serve. Our goal and our aim should be to be lowly. should not grab, not take. Some of you are saying, well, Pastor, didn't you preach that sermon last week? With James and John, didn't you preach that last week? Well, like I said, we need to keep exercising this. Matthew is emphasizing this point. He gave it to us last week in chapter 20, and he's given it to us again here in chapter 21, verse 5. Our lives are to be ones of service. Our lives are to be ones of bending the knee to help those around us. Those who clutch, those who grab, those who climb, those who kick others down, those are the ones who ultimately are cast out of the kingdom of heaven. Peter says, God exalts the humble, but casts down the proud. And the humble are exalted. So if we want to be part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, if we want to be we want to follow him and obey him and be his disciple, then we must take upon ourselves humility. We must be servants. But there's a trick with this. A lot of us think, forget this part of it. I just want to remind you of it this morning. From Philippians chapter 2. Whoops. That's features. All right, Philippians chapter 2. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Okay, so here's the humility. But it doesn't stay that way. Okay? It doesn't stay that way. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus comes in as a humble king. And he's going to be slain, and he's going to be bound, and he's going to be crucified, but ultimately he is going to be exalted. And that is how it works with us as well. We are humble. We are brought low. We serve those around us. We help those around us. We overlook offenses. We forgive sins. We confess our sins. We are a humble people. And yet, in the end, God exalts us. God exalts us, and God lifts us up. Okay? That's what he says in Peter as well. God exalts the humble or cast down the proud, but exalts the humble. So Jesus is Matthew is telling us here, this is the type of king we serve. And therefore, as members of his kingdom, that is the type of example we are supposed to follow. That is what we're supposed to look at. So one simple question to ask yourself is, do I serve those around me? And yes, this was the application last week also. <laughs> but do I serve those around me? Do I serve like Jesus? Jesus came into Jerusalem not to take, but to give. Do we enter situations to take or do we enter situations to give? So I encourage you as we think about Jesus, as we think about him coming into Jerusalem, let us remember that he's the promised king, the one who came. Let's remember the faithfulness of God's word and then let us also remember that he is the humble king and that we are to walk in his footsteps and be humble as well. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. Uh, we know that often we need to hear things more than once. And as we saw last week, your son came to serve and not to be served. And we see it again this week that he is the humble servant who comes into Jerusalem that he might give up his life for us who do not deserve it and who are not worthy. We ask, Lord, that you would help us in our own lives to demonstrate this same type of humility. Help us to be faithful, to follow after Jesus and, and follow his example. We also ask, Lord in heaven, that you would strengthen us by your word. Help us to cling to your word, to hold to your word, and not to hold to our feelings, not to hold to what we think or what the world says, but instead to hold, hold completely and solely to the promises given to us in your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.